All right. Thanks, Nathan. So, uh, yeah, the permissions are not enough. Roles and responsibilities for higher ed web governance. So definitely looking at the roles and responsibilities part in particular. Uh, but we are in an excellent city to be talking about governance. So hence the, the image that you see there. Um, quick introduction to me. I'm Mike Powers. I'm a content strategist at OHO. Uh, we were called OHO Interactive, but as of two weeks ago, we are just OHO. Um, and we're a digital agency. We do websites, we maintain websites, we do digital marketing for a lot of higher ed clients, as well as other nonprofits and healthcare clients. Um, I also have 15 plus years experience running university websites. I was a front end web developer. I was a content director. I was a web director, marketing director, a whole bunch of other roles. The title changed a lot. The work often remained the same. So uh, fun facts about me. I have a PhD in English, and I was actually a professor for a couple of years, which means that I can't answer your burning James Joyce question, should you have them during the question and answer period. Um, I am also from the Jersey Shore, uh, but I'm sorry to inform you, I will not be taking questions about Snooki at this time. Um, and then finally, I do now currently live in Pittsburgh, which is a wonderful city. Many of you have told me it's a wonderful city. I do ask that you come visit. And then if you come visit, please do respect the parking chairs. If someone puts a, par a chair on the street, that spot is theirs. It's the law. Seriously, the police will not move them. They just don't even get involved in that stuff. All right, we are gonna start with a quiz. So you are probably familiar with the default roles in WordPress. There are six of them that come out of the box. Um, so I have a series of questions for you and you will answer, and I'll try to relay your answers to the folks listening in at home. What is the right role for someone who needs to write content in WordPress? You can just shout it out. Author, what if they need to edit that content after it was published? Okay. If it's theirs. Oh, again, author their own content, but if they need to edit something that the, their predecessor did, right? So they just started the job now. Okay, so they're going to be an editor probably. Okay, what if they need to publish content? Editor, administrator. Um, I should say I was a web developer, but not for WordPress. So I don't actually know the answers to some of these questions. So I'm, I'm trusting you on this. Um, but okay, it could be administrator, could be editor. What if they need to review content before publication and maybe make a couple changes to it? Probably an editor. See, this I did kind of expect it to go this way. Um, what if they need to review content for accessibility and make sure all tags are correct and we're using headings properly? Also, editor, maybe an administrator. Uh, they're going to create visual content for the website and put it in that media library that everybody loves so much. Okay, maybe they can be an author. Um, they have to supply information about a degree program. They're a professor and I wanna tell you all about the mathematics program. Okay, could be a contributor. Yes, those lower three are rarely used, but um, they are there. Okay, so I'm just gonna say, a lot of the roles are the same, right? Whether you are publishing content or authoring content, we often end up with everybody's an editor or a couple of people are also administrators, which is also a little bit weird. So that's the, hence the title of my uh, presentation, right? If we're gonna govern the sites, permissions are not enough. And you know the part in the movie where they say the title of the movie, that is this part that you just saw right now, okay? So let's look at what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about governance. And one thing I've noticed, this is added last night after karaoke, uh, because I've heard a lot of different ways of talking about governance. And I just wanted to, wanted to be clear in the way that I'm talking about it, which is it's a framework establishing accountability, establishing roles, and establishing who gets to make the decisions on certain things. You notice it's mostly on the people side of things, not on the technology side of things. But I am interested in the technology side of things, too, because they, they do intersect. That is where I'm coming from. Here's what I want to talk about. First of all, what needs to happen to make a website run? And it's going to be a little bit um, idealized. What is in general, what do we need? And then second, how does it happen? 
uh, which is where we look at, no, actually, what are we going to do to make this work and who's going to do do those things? Uh, and what's the role of WordPress roles in that? Um, and then when Word, WordPress roles fail us, which they probably will, um, what do we do to get beyond that? So let's talk about workflow number one, which is how does content happen? Or maybe it's more specifically, how should content be happening? Because it happens in many ways on many websites that are not always ideal. So let's look at a more ideal sort of content life cycle. We're going to have content. Someone's going to have to write that content. Or they're going to take pictures or they're going to make video, edit video. It could be a number of things. Let's just call that. We're going to write that content. That definitely has to happen in every case. The next thing that really should happen is some editing of that content, right? We're publishing things to the whole world. It's it's the name, the World Wide Web. So having a second set of eyes on that before it goes out is a best practice. Does that always happen? Maybe not. Uh, and then we also need someone to publish that. Now, these the, the publisher and the writer could be the same person. The editor and the publisher could be the same person. But ideally, we have two people looking at this before it goes out to make sure that the word public has an L in it, as we talked about in our discussion before this. So um, in many cases, this is about the extent of the life cycle, but content keeps going on. And ideally, after it's published, we have a phase where we're monitoring it. That might be analytics, that might be site improvement, might be Dubbot, it might be your SEO platform, whatever it is. We're looking at it probably in a more automated way just to make sure that it's still there, still functioning, not giving us any obvious functions. It hasn't gone 404, all those kinds of things. But we also should occasionally audit that content and actually have a human read that content to make sure it still makes sense and to make sure it still works. Uh, and then eventually we should have a plan for saying goodbye to that content as well, that it doesn't need to be on the web for all time, right? So, and in my role uh, working with OHO, I look at a lot of websites and yeah, I find stuff from 1996 that's maybe, maybe not relevant anymore, right? So there should be a plan for that. Now, this is of course, maybe how things should happen. Um, but no matter what you do, all your content is in a workflow, right? If your workflow is write it, publish it, forget about it for 20 years, that's your workflow, right? And maybe you didn't choose that workflow. Um, and I'm here to say like, we should be choosing the workflow and thinking about how that is going to work, right? How do we create it? How do we make sure it's good? How do we keep it good over time? Next element of actually running a website, which is what I'm going to call functions, which are what are the things that we need to do to actually run the website? And it's kind of a handful of things. And I'm calling this website content functions. I'm a little more swayed towards the content area. I know there's also server side things that need to happen. Um, they don't come up with my clients as much as these kinds of things, right? So that has to be a source for the information. Then, you know, sometimes you're gonna create it for the web. Sometimes it wasn't created for the web, but it has to come from somewhere. Um, and then that content has to be actually created, right? So there's the information and then there's actually making it to something that goes on the web. It has to be reviewed. You see this is going along with our uh, workflow. You're going to have to analyze how well that is performing. You didn't just put it on there to put it on there. You put it on there to get conversions or get donations or do something. So is it doing the thing you need it to do? You're going to need to ensure that it's, it's accessible, make sure that it's free of errors. You're going to have to set some policies and rules around that. You're going to have to have somehow have the interest of the organization represented to the web team, right? You want your website to serve the organization. So somehow you need to find out what the organization wants from you. Um, and you need someone to say like, yeah, these people are doing it. They're the official web team. They're the ones who are authorized to do this and put all this on there, right? We could probably add a few things, but there's a core of things that for every website needs to happen. And this is pretty close to that core outside of who does it. Now, once we start thinking this way, we end up in sort of a project triangle, right? If you have a certain number of pages um, and you have a certain amount of time, then you're only going to reach a certain amount of quality, right? This is one of those things where... Uh, it isn't like choose to, but they're all 
based on each other, right? If you have a limited amount of time and you want high quality, then you can't have as many pages, right? This is like just sort of the iron rule of taking care of your website. They take time. And the more time you have, the more pages, the more quality you can have. Now you can have a lot of pages and no time and have a really crappy website, right? That is an option that you could choose here, but it is one that you really should be choosing and not going into, right? So every website is going to invo involve a certain investment of time to keep it online, to keep it up to date. And if you invest less time, you're going to have to reduce pages or reduce quality, right? Many higher edit organizations are choosing reduced quality by default because we haven't thought through who is going to take care of this piece that we have created. Okay, finally, let's talk about roles. Who is going to do that? So if you imagine all the things you need to do as this big circle here, um, then you need to divide those up amongst different people, amongst different roles, right? And you know, it's probably not going to be an even division of like, you know, all these people are going to do an equal amount of stuff. It probably looks more like this. Um, there are lots of different ways to do this. You can divide these up different ways, have different roles, have different titles. The one thing I do want to notice here is the lot of the work, maybe the majority of the work of the hours on the website might be coming from your web authors and web editors, although it might be a very small amount of time per person. It's a lot of people, right? So I see a lot of websites where like, we have 500 web editors and they're all typing away and they're making content and they're, they're doing their thing, right? So lots of ways you can divide it up. Um, it's also possible if you really want to, to rock it old school um, and just have that one person that does everything, right? But we have, we have moved beyond that. You're going to have to have some more specific roles to actually get this done. Here's a way to do it. It's not the way, but I think the quadrants here make sense. And first thing I want you to notice is I have roles here that don't have CMS access. And I have roles that do have CMS access. There are people who have a role in the website who do not, or maybe should not have editing access within the CMS. And they're important people, right? Your president has a role in the website. I sincerely hope he or she is not a web editor. That should not be happening, um, but they have a role because they will be asked by donors about the website, right? They'll be asked by other people. They have set the strategic direction of the university. So there's a role, right? The VPs have a role. Um, if you have a web advisory committee, they have a role and they don't necessarily have access. Um, and then I've also divided this into central and peripheral. And the central is the people who are within that main team um, direct reporting relationships, maybe they're located in Old Main, maybe they're located in a forgotten administrative facility far, far away from parking. Either one of those things, right? But they all have a relationship. You look at the org chart, they're there. But you also have a whole bunch of peripheral people. They have a role, they have a say, they're doing things, but they don't have that direct reporting website uh, with a web team. And that might be your deans, that might be your subject matter experts, your web editors, and your web authors. So the roles you see on here might not be exactly these roles, but you still have these four quadrants of people who are central, people who are peripheral, people who have CMS access, and people who do not or maybe should not have access. So quick old rule of who those things, right? Your president, strong interest in the website, but should not be involved day to day. Same with the web advisory committee, right? They're those people who are going to represent what does the campus want, and ideally also represent to the back to the campus, here's how the web team is actually doing those things. Um, in the peripheral box, you've got those deans. Again, strong interest, not involved day to day. Subject matter experts, they could also be a web editor, a web author, but they don't need to be content auditor, someone who can go through and say, yes, this information is correct. They don't necessarily have to have a CMS role, although they could. In the central one, this is where there's lots of people, and I wish you had this many people on your web team, but I know you probably don't, right? But you need someone who's overseeing the content, someone who's overseeing the technical aspects of the website. Ideally, someone who's training and supporting those web editors and publishers so they, they're doing the right thing, right? There's a whole bunch of central content that's going to need to be written centrally. There's analytics to be looked at. 
there's photos and videos to be created. It's great if you have an accessibility champion who can really be always looking out for accessibility and complying with the law on that. It's great to have a QA champion who is looking at the bottom, looking at site improve and making sure that things are correct. And you may have a news editor who's putting out news. It might be your PR director too. You might have an events editor who's helping put events out, right? Tons of different roles, tons of different ways to divide that up. And then you've got the peripheral people with CMS access, the web editors and the web publishers here, right? So people who can compose and design, but then people also have published. Sometimes they're gonna be the same people depending on how you do it. So it's a big um, bunch of people, but here's the crux of all of this, right? You've got people who are the central and what do they need to do? They need to not be overwhelmed with edit and publish requests, right? You can't run every page publication through your central team unless you have staff beyond anything I have ever actually seen. Um, and then they also, you need to maintain consistency and quality and um, compliance of that web experience. On the periphery, they mostly want to publish quickly, right? The department chair asked me to do this and I want to get in there. Uh, and then there's the wants where on the central side, yes, we want to control all the things. It would really be best if you would let us do that, but we can't do that. Uh, and of course, the periphery also would love to have no limits. Please just let me do what I want. I know what I'm doing. I know what that, right? So that is the central sort of problem, I think, that we need to solve through governance. And here's one solution that can help with that, right? This is having a different sort of a different set of content levels, content types, right? We want every page on the side to be perfect, but this is a way of saying every side on the page doesn't have to be quite as perfect as the other ones, right? So one way to handle this is have authoritative content. This is a small, this is a handful of pages, not that many, that are business critical, right? This is your tuition page. This is your list of programs. This is your top level pages. They need to be accurate. They need to be up to date, accessible, all those things, 24, 7, 365. No question about that, right? Then you have a set of core content, which is pretty important for day-to-day -day operations, but you know, maybe there's maybe it's not always up as up to date, right? Not as mission critical. So that might be your career center homepage. Up your admissions content, not your admissions form or RFI forms, right? But some of the uh, supporting admissions content, development content. And then you got a whole bunch of stuff that you can say, okay, this is non core. It's not mission critical. It is the uh, resume review workshop have, happening in the library. Like I would hope that is accurate and gives the right room number, but if it does not, I, we're not going to get too, too worried about that. And that's managed outside the central team. But that, but but it's managed to meet accuracy and content quality standards that we are going to set. So, faculty profile pages are a great example of this, right? I don't want to go and make sure their profile is up to date and accurate. That's on them. I don't want to mess with that. But it should be accessible, right? It shouldn't have broken links on it. There are some standards that need to be met there. Once you have those different content types, you can have some different workflows for that content. And this is where we're starting to get back to WordPress, by the way. But it'd be great to have authoritative content that only the central team can edit or publish, right? Nobody can touch the tuition page except people who are in the central team. There's like three people. We have backups. We will talk to the bursar. We will make sure that the tuition is accurate, but no, they're not going to touch it at this page. Then there's core stuff where Peripheral users can edit it, but maybe Central's going to publish those things, but there's going to be some interaction with the Central team on these major pages because we know they're still important for business. And then the non-core ones where Central's not going to be involved in the initial editing or publishing process, right? They're going to go ahead and they're going to do those things and we're going to monitor them. We're going to review them later. We're going to catch those, you know, any errors on the backside, but they're, they're going to go ahead and, and do that, right? So this is one step you can take to try to get that under control. Um, and then you'll see that played out as we start to talk about the actual roles here, right? So how is all that going to work on your campus beyond like setting what's authoritative, what's not, what's core, what's non-core? Here's how that might look when you 
bring it up. And this, I'm calling it a small team. We have two people on this web team. Those are the orange boxes here, right? Um, and then we have up to blue boxes up top, which are sort of like overseeing the web team, but do not have web access. So, you know, the web board that's going to authorize it, represent the interests, maybe solve uh, disputes. And then your communications director, CMO, VP. So uh, when we saw the uh, presentation that was an iambic pentameter yesterday, uh, one thing that's, that I was thinking to myself is, why does the director of communications have access to edit that menu? Like, why are they doing that? And they shouldn't be, probably, unless your team is really, really, really small, right? But that comms director role is more like, yes, this is the strategy. The web team came and gave them the policies. They said, yes, these are the policies. Um, and in a role like this, the content director has a whole bunch of stuff to do, right? Including training people, including reviewing important content. Um, and the front end web developer has a whole bunch of stuff to do, right? Besides supporting the site, but analyzing performance. Again, you can divide these things up differently. Here's another way of doing that with maybe a four person web team. In this case, I've said, okay, let's have an editor, editor in chief that is just policies and reviewing co top level content. And then a digital content editor who's gonna be more in the weeds with content. A support specialist just to support the people out there who need to work with the web. And then a front end web developer and still not that big of a team. So they still have a lot of things to do. Also in this scenario, dividing up web publishers and web authors. So the publishers are able to publish authors don't have that ability to publish to make sure we're getting two sets of eyes on everything. Um, and then subject matter experts who may or may not have access, right? And people can inhabit more than one role. You could be a subject matter expert who is also an author or a publisher, but if they are in those roles, they need to understand what those roles are, right? So if you say, okay, you're now a web author, there has to be a definition of what that is, right? It isn't like, Hey, we gave you access. Please read the documentation. You know, it'll be it'll it'll be okay, right? The key to this is that you have roles defined. You've assigned the functions to the roles, but also the people in those roles actually know what their job is, which is where documenting those roles come out, right? And there's a bunch of ways you can do this, and you can write out here are the duties, here are the responsibilities. One way that's a good way to do this quickly and develop that is the RAISI chart, which I'm sure you have seen before, right? But some people are responsible for actually doing the work. Some people are accountable to make sure that work got done. Others are consulted and they influence the work. Some people are just informed so they know what's happening. And some people have no role at all in those things. And when you put that into a chart, you will get something like this, right? So functions are down the left side of this. Roles are across the top, and we're very clearly saying, like, hey, who is going to set the content policies and roles? That is going to be the editor-in-chief, and the accountability on that is probably going to be comms director, web advisory board, one of those things. But they're the one who's in the trenches doing those things, right? They're going to review that con top-level content, um, but they're not going to write that top-level content, right? They're accountable for that, but the digital content editor will do that, and so forth. So this is the next step right one is saying okay we have a bunch of pages we're going to divide those pages into levels and we're going to care about those levels we care about all the levels but we're going to care about some levels a little bit more than others next is documenting those roles so people actually know what it is they're going to do this is where we come back to wordpress because we've got all these roles and then governance roles and we then have these six WordPress roles, right? And so we try to put those together and it kind of looks like this. And this is what I've encountered often working with clients to help them develop governance plans, to help them define what are the roles that are work on your campus? What are, what are the relationships you're gonna have? A lot of this process is a social process. It is about change management. It is about working together in a different way. But then when we get to WordPress, or to be honest, any other CMS, things start to fall apart as far as that, right? And this is where the permissions aren't really enough, but also it would be nice to have more than just the editor role. I know I'm exaggerating here. Some of these might be admins, some could maybe be authors, but it's still like a lot of people with a lot of access to, the, to this site. So there are some options and I've been listening for options a whole time I'm here because again, I'm not a WordPress, but I want to know. And one, one of the biggest ones obviously is multi-site. I'm looking forward to the next presentation, which is multi-site without multi 
Drive, uh, which maybe captures some of the issues with multi-site. And as I am understanding it, right? You're going to get this extra super admin role. That's really cool. We can give users different permissions on different sites, and you can have a lot more independence for your subsite managers, right? But on the con side, it seems like there are performance issues possible. It seems like the people in this room don't have that problem because we're really smart and we know how to run multi-site. Um, but it is more complex to administer users, management, migrations. And then, of course, there's more independence for subsite managers, which can also be a problem there, right? So that's one. And I'm not saying it's not a solution, just saying that's one solution. It's not a perfect solution. Another option are workflow plugins. Uh, and I was happy to hear Publish Press described as a spaghetti bowl of insanity. Um, so uh, these have their limitations too, right? On the pro side, they kind of look perfect. Like you can add workflows, you can add user types and reviews and reminders and checklists and all kinds of things that work. On the con side, it's another developer in your ecosystem. It's another thing to keep updated. It's another possible source of security issues, another possible source of accessibility issues. Um, and it may or may not actually adapt to the roles and the workflows and the roles that you actually want. So this is where we get back to, this is part of the solution. And I would love to hear more tech solutions that can work, that can actually help these things work. But in the long run, multi-site plugins, other solutions are not going to help. They're going to help, but they're not, they are not enough. And that is because determined users will always find a ways around any technical barrier you set up. They will put the inline code styles in there, right? They will include, they will put an iframe in, and that iframe will be 100 pixels bigger than the viewport just because, right? There's always ways around that. So the real lesson of governance is that there is a technical aspect to it, but the thing that really has to be straight is communication with people and some of the things you do. Now, these these solutions are not perfect either, right? If I had a perfect solution for government governance, the whole world would be different, I promise you. But um, this is part of the part of it, right? Do you have standards that are set forth that it's say, hey, this is how we want content to be. This is the voice and tone we want. This is the strategy you're going to follow. This is how you're going to use photographs and images. This is how you're allowed to use gen generative AI. This is accessibility. That one's easy. Follow the law, please. Uh, this is, you know, the privacy standards, the quality assurance standards. There's others that we could put here, right? But this is a first step that say like, yeah, a lot of people on campus are going to have access to this website. A lot of people are going to be able to make content, but there's a set of standards that you have to follow. And then second on of, of all that is, of course, then training to make sure they know what those things are to do, right? And it's mostly like two kind of basic training modules that they need. One is about web content, and that's the one that they don't want because they want the one that tells them how to get in there and publish things, right? But I like to put this one first. And it doesn't have to go through all the policies in detail, but they need to know the basics there about how to create content that's actually going to get done what they want to get done. The next part, though, is requiring that users actually complete both trainings. This is where you filter your comms director out of the pool of web editors, right? Because part of what you need to do here is set expectations that if you're going to be doing stuff on the web, you are going to meet a certain standard. You're going to know certain things that this is a professional role that you have and not just an extra duties is otherwise assigned thing that you're going to do when you, when you have time for it. Right. And then along with that, it's really helpful to say you should do a refresher training. You could say, hey, every year you're going to do a refresher training. Or you could say, hey, you've not logged in for a year um, and you will really need to go through this training again before you can get back into the website and start updating things. Another one, and I talked about this one in our discussion before this, is the idea of the site charter, which I think is really powerful. Before a site is created, right? Someone comes and says, hey, we need a website. You draw up a little document that we call charter, probably call it something else, but it's gonna specify a few things. It's gonna specify who are, who, what are the user roles here, right? Who is our contact? Who's the editor? Who's the publisher? And most importantly, who is the sponsor? This is where that non-CMS role comes in, right? If you're talking to the anthropology department, it's probably the chair of anthropology is the sponsor, the person who can say like, Yes, we need a website. You probably already have this website. I, I, I understand that. But 
Um, and they're also going to have to specify, okay, who's the audience for this site? Who are we actually talking to, right? And the general public is not really a great answer to that. So who specifically are we trying to talk to? And then what are the goals? What are we telling them? How does that support your office? Like beyond having a website, what is it you're trying to do with this? And how many hours a week are people going to spend on this, right? Are you actually putting resources against this thing that you have said that you want? It's not quite a legal document. It's great to have people sign it just as sort of like understanding, acknowledge it through email, whatever, whatever it is. But the real value here is in the talk about it, the negotiation about it, what they say you want to do. You're like, oh, we want to recruit students. Okay, we have an admissions site that is there for recruiting students. What's the role of your site in recruiting students? And do we need to repeat all that stuff? Um, again, a really powerful thing. Obviously, you don't, you have a lot of sites already that are on this. Redesigns are a great time to say like, hey, before we move your site over to the new site from the current site, um, let's just make sure we're clear on what the, what the goals are there. And then there's communication, which, you know, I understand is not everybody's favorite thing to do, but um, it's very important that outside of the rules, outside of the training, outside of the sort of like desperate phone calls that you've got an ongoing back and forth about that, right? So part of it is just being available. Like people can contact you really easily and then you're actually helpful when they call. That could be through Slack or Teams. If your audience uses those tools, I've seen people say, yeah, we have a Slack channel open all the time and no one ever talks to us. Well, that's because your audience doesn't use Slack. So you might need to do something different. Contacts form can work. People mostly don't like filling out contact forms, but if you are very responsive with that, calling people back, letting them know what you're going to do, that can work. Um, but probably email is inevitable in this case. And sorry about that. But this is part of it is that these people need to be formed into not just uh, customers, but we are the community of people who put stuff on the web, right? We have been trained. We know what we're doing. We have our time assigned to this and we're all working together to make this better. So quick summary of all these things, then we can talk more about how WordPress can solve these things, right? Content is something that actually exists in workflows. Your content is always being born or dying or just malfunctioning terribly. It's always there at some phase there. The functions are what you have to do to keep the website online up to date. And then the roles are what the way people actually get that done. They can be varied from one org to another, but they really do need to be documented. WordPress user roles can assign different permissions to different roles, but they're not going to match up with the roles your governance requires. So in the end, that governance, that framework, establishing authority, uh, accountability roles, decision-making authority is a thing that is made of people, not technology. Um, and I think that's the end. I have many ways to be contacted, um, but there's time for questions, I'm quite sure. Yes. Sure. Organization of educational structures was something that had come from CDBA. Now she can say, I think there's a profession who can take care of their own website. They wrote a paper, they should put it on there. I think it's not realistic to expect a classics professor who publish on the paper or book every two or three years to be familiar with or comfortable with these tools. And I think that you're going to end up with, in, in fact, if we, if we think about it, now that there aren't ebooks anymore, are really the core of the mission, and they're really more important than an article about an alumni or a football game or whatnot. The prospective students, other scholars, other mm -hmm. people who are trying to coach your profession, everyone looks at this stuff. And I think it's really important for communications teams to put as much be able to say to a professor, if you want to do it yourself and you're comfortable with it, that's great. It's like all the physics professors, you know, because they invented HTML, they fixed it, you know, like they mm -hmm. uh, make people make mess. But uh, that I think it's really important to put some uh, some firepower behind that and say, look, if you're not comfortable putting up your new CV or your new whatever, we're here to help you with it. Not you, you do it yourself and, or come to a training because they'll just be like, why should I come to a training and do that? I'm not going to get tenure for that. I'm not going to do that. So. Yeah. Okay.
So the argument uh, against me is is one that I agree with, but I'll try to summarize it for the people at home, which is that, you know, uh, some professors want to get in there and publish their own stuff. Others don't want to do it. And there's no reason we should expect an expert in classics or biology or anything else to also be an expert in web publishing, which actually I totally agree with that, right? The way that I would handle it in the kind of governance that I'm talking about here is that absolutely, if you're a professor and you want to publish, you can do that. Um, but being a web editor comes with these responsibilities, right? You're going to have to create accessible content. You're going to have to create content um, that, you know, that fits, fits in our rules. Um, and that's great. We can help you do that. But we can also, there are ways to get things done for you. And that might not be the central team who's posting that classics paper. That might be someone in the College of Humanities who has the training to do that. But absolutely, they should be able to do those kinds of things. And um, I didn't mean to imply otherwise. What percentage of university comms people and web people do you think would want to talk with you about or well, I think a lot of them, you know, to your point about you know, how many papers you have and how much time you have and how much thought they want, I think a lot of teams, what I see, it actually happens frequently is they take it to the back of them and they say, it's your problem, I'll say, I did not I'll see it. your page. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not a realistic thing. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, it's still a good chance. Okay, that's a little bizarre in that how it is literally a good chance to talk to the school and not show themselves. Yeah. Okay, so people are I think small place, two hundred professors, and most people behave themselves. <laughs> yes. So but they don't want to they don't want to publish on the web except for you know that. So yeah, I mean that's a general yeah. They can't be expected to be so I I'll break in. And again, try to summarize that for the people on Zoom, which is, is, is my summary. Faculty profiles are like just so hard uh, because they want stuff to be updated, but they don't necessarily have the skills. There's total goodwill there, though, right? You have very few professors who are out there to like do something crazy that would you know look bad on the university. And in general, they have academic freedom to do the things that they, they want to do. But it is it is a tough problem to solve. But I've never seen a perfect solution. Maybe you have one, but I I, I don't know about that. Um, there is one question in here which is a very easy question, which is uh, will our slide will the slides be available after the presentation? Um, it's a good guide for projects she wants to do. So yes, yes, these slides will be available after the presentation. <laughs> 